Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session on NGO development in Namibia. If you are watching us on Facebook or YouTube, please share and invite others to join this session. Share your thoughts and questions on the comment below. That is why at Capricorn Foundation, which is Capricorn Group's vehicle for corporate social responsibility initiative, has partnered with Bank Windhoek Social Investment Fund and the Lithon Foundation to present to you an online discussion exploring the ever-changing environment of non-profit organizations in Namibia. Capricorn Groups believes in the principle of working together with like-minded partners to make a positive and a significant impact on society. Hence, the collaboration to add much-needed value to the NGOs across the country. The purpose for this capacity-building workshop is to respond to the needs of NGOs. COVID-19 has brought to the surface the need for wealth organizations not only to relook their financial situation, but further ensure that the um, pardon me, but to further ensure that they are approaching potential donors or fund funders in professional way when it comes to requesting for funding. During the session, we'll also delve into the importance of reporting, fundraising, while ensuring that organizations are compliant with all the necessary requirements for registration. We are excited to have all of you tune in and believe this session will be uh, beneficial to you all. We will kick off with a session uh, with a word of welcome from our Capricorn cha Chairman, Mr. Joan Swanapool. Joan, over to you. Thank you, Alphonse. And then, sorry, pardon me. And then afterwards, we will comment with our discussion um, with the topic at hand, and we'll be joined on stage by my uh, panelist. On my left hand side, Ms. Sabina Jacobs from the Ministry of Health and Social Services, the Registrar of National Welfare Board. Hannes Kutier on my right, who is the Audit Manager from SGA, Chartered Accountants and Auditors. Susanne Nell on my far right, who is the Board Member of Space Charity and Panache Daringo from uh, Monjila Project Advisory in Namibia. Thank you, Juan. Uh, yes, now we'll switch over to Joan for a short introduction on Capricorn. Thank you very much. Partners, colleagues, members and friends of the corporate social investment community, good morning to you all. It is my privilege this morning to welcome you on behalf of the Capricorn Foundation, the Bank Windhoek Social Investment Fund and the Leithon Foundation to this capacity building workshop for NGOs. The Capricorn Group firmly believes that in the principle of working together with like-minded partners to make a positive impact on society. And we have no doubt that this workshop will be sound proof of the power of collaboration. Due to the COVID-19 regulations, we are broadcasting this workshop online. This is not ideal when you discuss a topic like corporate social responsibility, but I'm sure that we will still achieve our objective today. The objective to collaborate and share ideas and information to help NGOs navigate these uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, the Capricorn Foundation is our group's so vehicle for corporate social responsibility initiatives and it's a registered welfare organization with the Ministry of Health and Social Services. Our foundation is financially supported by our flagship brand, Bank Windhoek. The Bank Windhoek Social Investment Fund is widely recognized for its positive contribution to and upliftment of Namibian communities over the last 20 years. The Capricorn Foundation and the Bank Windhoek Social Investment Fund will work together closely to make an even bigger positive impact in the community in future. The Leithon Foundation our partner in today's workshop also has a solid track record when it comes to capacity building initiatives for NGOs. Leithon is currently assisting the government in collating and setting up a much needed centralized database of all charities in Namibia. For us at Capricorn Group, 
Corporate social responsibility means doing the right things at the right time and for the right reasons. Our group's CSR vision is to be an inspiring connector of positive change by creating economic value and sustainable opportunities for advancing and improving the economic and social conditions in the communities in which we operate. We recognize your value as welfare organizations and stakeholders to co collaborate with us in realizing our vision and responding to our community's needs. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the surface the need for most organizations, including welfare organizations, to rethink its strategies to ensure, ensure future sustainability and growth. We all almost have to reinvent ourselves. The continuing difficult economic environment has put a lot of businesses under severe financial pressures, which impact on their ability to build economic value. This has a negative impact on the ability of welfare organizations to raise funds for the very important work that they do in the communities. In our engagements with a number of welfare organizations during the past few months, it was evident that there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety about the future and that many organizations are experiencing serious financial challenges. The idea of a capacity building workshop for NGOs was born out of a need for a platform for welfare organizations to get together and discuss matters such as fundraising and governance. There are many organizations who are seeking funding from the same pool of resources. It is therefore very important for NGOs to have a clear proposition for potential donors, to be explicit about its positive impact in communities and to have plans in place to ensure future sustainability. Namibia faces several social challenges and the needs are great. Our focus should be on sharing scarce resources with like-minded partners and not to duplicate efforts. This will help ensure that we make the biggest possible impact where the need is the greatest. We sincerely hope that you will benefit from this workshop and that the tools you receive and the skills that you learn and develop here today will indeed help you to realize your vision and objectives. Your calling is not an easy one, yet, in my experience, it is the most rewarding. We would therefore like to join hands with you so that we can set an example of working together towards a sustainable future. In closing, I would like to thank you for your contribution to create positive change in our communities and wish you the very best in, this imp in the important work that you're doing. I also wish you the very best for this workshop and trust that you will get out of it what you really need. Thank you so much. Let's take a walk together through precious milestones lined with fear and uncertainty. You learned, you bonded, celebrating life's little victories whenever they came along. You practiced over and over and over again, pursuing perfection, persevering through hardships, never losing sight of your vision, your dream of a better world, building relationships, for happily ever after. Shaping a brighter future for all together. No matter your journey, we are here with you every single step of the way because yours is a relationship worth banking on. Well, welcome back to our next session. Yuan, thank you very much for that brief introduction. Now we move over to our panel discussion and I'd like to start with Ms. Sabina Jacobs from the Ministry of Welfare and Social Services. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Ms. Sabina. Uh, first of all, I feel really privileged and honored to be part of a panel discussion mm. um, around welfare organizations in Namibia. Um, it is really a breakthrough for the ministry that we start um, on a new journey um, and when I'm sitting with the panel um, 
And I'm so glad to see that those re wealth organizations that we registered is part and parcel to bring a better future Aye. for the most vulnerable persons in the community. When I look to, um, to our panel member, I, I was not even thinking that she is from SPES and I was the one who registered them. And I think last year we uh, approved your registration. Um, and even like Lithon Foundation, I really um, have a very close um, relationship with Lithon since um, 2019. And through Lithon, NGOs or welfare organizations become very prominent um, and people start understanding what is welfare organization. And Lithon Foundation is also registered with the ministry. Um, and then now recently we registered um, the Capricorn Foundation. And it is so good for me to see that we are not standing anymore alone, but that we can join hands. Because um, welfare organizations is actually a, a community-based voluntary social welfare services that you bring to the community. Right. Because when you look at Ministry of Health and Social Services, and I think recently um, in the media it was say, how many clients for one social worker? Mm. And you know that the community, these welfare organizations, is community-based organizations that is on at grassroots level, they are directly there, close to the, the people who need this uh, um, their services. Right. So welfare organizations actually um, is, is they make they, 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 they make the services accessible as well as affordable. Because welfare organizations, when we look at social welfare services, social welfare service is mostly uh, 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 dealing with, with, with social problems in the community. Mm -hmm. So when a group of persons, of even one person notice in his community, there is a problem in my community in terms of teenage pregnancies or it can be elderly abuse or it can be that most children are not going to school that is um, supposed to be in the school and so on. So you realize the need and you decide, let me bring a change to my community. And now this wealth organization, they come to our offices. If they find out where will we register and Later on, they uh, realize, okay, someone tell them, go to Ministry of Health and Social Services, they registered welfare organizations. Mm -hmm. So welfare organizations is registered under uh, uh, um, the National Welfare Act uh, uh, of 1965. It's a very old act. It's actually an act from South Africa. Okay. And we are in the process um, to, to, to develop the, the, the welfare organization bill now. Uh, and the bill will be very responsive to the, res to the challenges that welfare organizations face now. So when a, 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 a group of persons or a person alone or association, they want now to do these community-based services, but they also need then financial assistance from the state, from a local authority or from the public. Right. They they must register it as a welfare organization because uh, that is what the act prescribes. It is not what Ms. Jacob is saying. Mm. No, it is the act and we are here to implement the act. And, and you know the fact that when you start doing social welfare services, you get some f of, of, uh, funds from uh, a donor, even like Capricorn or SPES, they also can give something. But if you are not registered, then now, how do you know that that funds or that donation is going directly to the vulnerable person? Right. The person that is really actually in need of that one mm -hmm. and not going in your pocket. Ne? So the moment when you start registered, ne, it's give you that legal right, ne, right to approach the community, to go out in the public and request for these funds and these donations to write uh, 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 financial proposals to different type of, of donors or financial institutions mm -hmm. to assist you to carry out your objectives. Uh, um, to make the life better for those persons that you are coming because you actually you are you you are like um, standing there uh, uh, on behalf of someone who, ha who cannot who do not have a voice right. who are not knowing where to go but you as a welfare organization you are there to, to help them and to bring them out of that uh, distress situation that right. they are and so on so that is the reason why we are registered welfare organization first of all to make sure that you have the legal right secondly also to protect the public mm -hmm. so that you can know that when i give money or i give food or whatsoever it is not going to sabina's uh, pocket of house but it's going to that person that you say that elderly, that uh, teenage girl or that vulnerable child and, and, and then you have, and, and even the donor 
will have that comfort to know there is a ministry where this person are registered of this organization. There is a monitoring system in place uh, because you must re uh, report back to the ministry mm -hmm. annually with an annual report to tell us this is what we will do, that is what we did for the whole year. We received this funds for, from this organization, and that's why they, the act requires audited financial reports. Right. Yeah, because the, 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 the welfare organization management, uh, um, in, in his uh, organizational structure, they will have a, a treasurer. The treasurer must have that um, bookkeeping skills for everything that is coming in to keep books. And after the, the financial book year, then they can send the financials to the auditor, and the auditor will then do the, the audit of the books and so on and then we receive all those documents right miss uh, Jacobs let me just interject quickly quickly run us through the process of registration what are the legal requirements from your entity mm. to the organizations out there okay first of all the welfare organizations they know must know they must come to Ministry of Health and Social right. so when they approach your office first of all they will come and say um, I want to register my organization then you will ask them okay um, what is that your organization intend to do? Then they will say, we want to do work uh, of to help the vulnerable children in our community. These children are, uh, uh, reach the school age, in, uh, age, but they are not going to school. Uh, so how, what can I do and so on? So what do we then do? We, we give them constantly consultations because so that that person that is in your office that they can understand um, uh, that, that this is a voluntary uh, community-based services name that this organization will improve the lives of that person so what we will do then when you took them through the consultation you will tell them there's an application form that you must complete uh, and then secondly then you must have a constitution your constitution is actually your legal document that is uh, um, uh, helping the management committee how to manage the organization right. so the constitution is a very very important document and then with that one then we also ask a letter of auditor ne, so that we can know that because that is what the ex say uh, audited financial statements should be sent annually to the ministry and then um, uh, then we will also tell them if we approve your constitution then you will go and advertise your name and then your objectives in the uh, in the government cassette and in one of the national newspapers. Okay, um, say for instance, if this person can't afford to pay for the um, advertisement in the national cassette, is there a different route they can take, or does the ministry compensate them for that? The unfortunate thing is that um, the ministry cannot compensate, but what we ask them is that you come up with this idea so you will have seven members ne? so among your seven members find out what is the cost um, for, for, for advertisement as well as the, uh, what it will cost for the auditor to give you that letter to say that, the, that your organization appoint them so there is no other route it's only amongst themselves that can um, solicit money and mm. so on, pay for it and so on uh, and that is the that, and, and, and even the registration process at the ministry doesn't cost them anything. It is right. free. It's for free. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have a time frame maybe um, that they have to wait for the registration to take place? <laughs> or doesn't it really matter? So, no, you know, uh, all of us want, when you look to customer care services, we really want that uh, there should be uh, a time period that you will start and finish. Now. So some of the organization, the, the when you go uh, when you go with them this road of registration some of them later on realize no I don't think I will make it mm. then they will never come back ne? then there's right. others that going through the whole process now the process is like that this is that we have regional welfare committees in each region uh, and then at the that the applicant must go then to the social worker's office where he will get then all the documents and then after coming with the back of the documents then uh, um, the social worker will uh, it is a secretariat for the regional welfare committee in the office of the social work so she will then discuss it with the chairs and they will type table it then the, the the regional welfare committee consists out of different line ministries as well as community persons and then they will discuss is there a need for such organization in this community okay and then they will look 
look to the uh, application and the, the constitution and then they recommend. Then the, it comes back to the social worker. The social worker informs the, the client and say, it is recommended that you can go on with this, but you must first go and advertise for 21 days. Mm -hmm. The reason for advertising for 21 days in a in the in, um, government cassette and um, in any national uh, newspaper is that the public must know about your intention to register your organization. So you will go and advertise then your name as well, your objectives. Because the objectives is very important to tell the, the public, this is what this organization will do. So after, of during the 21 days, it, it, there's a possibility that someone in the community will say, no, this organization, I know already this organization, I don't think that it must be registered. So it is an objection against your organization, to right. your prospective organization. And then it will bring the, the, the objections will then come to our ministry. Then you will find, uh, do then sort of an investigation. And if it is not really, the, the, the objection does not have grounds and you can see, no, this organization is a very good organization, it will be to the beneficial of the community, then you will register. But then it's not the regional welfare committee, the regional welfare committee is sitting four times in the year. Okay. So after they sit in, in, in the National Welfare, Welfare Board is the one that register. So after they receive uh, um, the, the original welfare Board, they sent it through my office. I prepared the documents and then I uh, 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 table it at the National Welfare Board where a board will sit from different regions mm -hmm. and uh, in different ministries also, and they will look into the uh, to the application. The regional, the chairperson of the regional welfare committee will actually then come and present this application, and then on grounds that you can see now it is a, it, it it is it meet the minimum requirements, and then we will register. Then uh, the board uh, will then make a decision, grant approval. Then they will give it to me. Then I will now write now the registration certificate with a registration letter and. Um, call the, 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 the chairperson of that organization to come and get them the registration certificate. So you cannot, uh, we really try as far as possible to do things to fast, speed up, yeah. yeah, to speed up the process and so on. Right. So even in our bill, uh, uh, we see that these four c c um, re uh, regional welfare committees is, is, it, it is it's a, it's prolonged the process. Mm. So rather uh, then we propose in the bill that it should be monthly. Okay. And the National Welfare Board, it was only two, but we propose also that they have four now. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much for that mouthful <laughs> <laughs> of information. But we really do appreciate that. Okay. Now I'd love to hear from Mr. Mm. Hannes. You spoke about auditors. So we want to hear what the process is, Mr. Hannes, um, in terms of assisting the welfare organizations through the auditing process. Would you just run us through that? Yes. I think if, uh, if I can come in here, um, I would just touch base on, on what Sabina said and also what uh, Mr. Jan said regarding the, the corporate social citizen, citizenship and your, your welfare organization. So the objectives of your organization uh, determines who's going to be your donors in, in the future. Mm. And uh, there was a question regarding the corporate governance of such an entity. And the problem with, with it is if you don't have strict rules or a uh, mission and a vision for, for your entity, you're not ensured that or the, the donor that's uh, donating funds is not ensured that that funds is eventually going into the right hands, as, as Sabina said. Right. So in, in terms of that, that was one of the questions that was raised um, earlier, is, is what is the, the need for you to ensure that you um, are, are consistent with your objectives? Mm. So the need for that is if I am a donor donating from another country or from the public or from the state, I would like to know that if I, for instance, um, my my dream is to uh, is, um, get out the, the gender equality of, a, of in, in Namibia, for instance. Then I want to know that my funds that's donated is going for that, or for the elderly people, or for um, young people that uh, is, is uh, disadvantaged or something. So mm. that is specifically the need, therefore. And therefore, you need to ensure that your objectives is set out, and it is then in the, in the newspaper, so that anybody can comment on that, that. And then you have to ensure that you are working towards that ag objectives and that is the only thing and the people that need to ensure that that objectives is met is your trustees or the directors uh, um, depending on on the way of registration that you right. that you take so your trustees of your entity should ensure that you are meeting that requirement and that is where the funds is spent so from the donor's side because if that is not the case then the donor will eventually not 
um, donate funds in the future. Okay. So that is to make the positive impact where that company or where your organization is currently needed. Mm -hmm. So from there, there's a, a certain criteria um, for a donor that they would look at, and the one is the financial statements eventually. And there's also some other requirements, but any donor that donates money to you um, will look at what your ob objectives are. So that is the, the means of determining if they are going to give you money. Correct. Um, so if, if I, for instance, do something that they don't approve of, they will not give me funds in the future. So there's no specific criteria that they say this and this and this is the stuff that we need, but they will look at what their heart is. So we know this is, this is it's, it's relating to our emotion. So this is our heart. So what is Lethon Foundation's heart for their investments in the future? And they have a few pillars that needs to be met. And for, for them to be no donating money, they will specifically donate to people with the objectives that they have in mind and what is in their heart. So that's just from, from the funding side and the corporate governance. And that's why that is very important for an entity to, right. to do that. And then part of the... the um, the corporate governance is your financial statements, your audit of financial statements. And the, the Act requires it. That's the first thing. So if you're not doing that, you're, you're not, in, you, you're not do, uh, fulfilling the requirements of the Act, and you will also not be able to present the audit of financial statements mm. to yeah. the wealth, uh, the, the um, ministry, ministry of yeah. uh, ministry thereof. So the first thing is it's required by the Act. Um, and then the second thing is required by all the donors that you do, usually the donors, and then all other stakeholders, because they want to know and ensure that the money that they give to that welfare organization goes to the people that need it. Needs right. it. So as Sabina said, I think she, she used the, uh, the words of the less privileged people. That is the people that we need to ensure that they get the, the money and the benefit of that entity. Mm. Um, if you spend the money uh, buying luxurious cars or whatever for the directors, that is not in the objective and not in your corporate governance um, of that entity. So that's then not not part of your mission and vision of your entity. Right. So the the statement is required by the donors, the act, and then the stakeholders of that company. And the um, it's it's required in order to ensure that the funds that is is spent and that is donated to that company or the the, the, so the corporate citizen is eventually contributed to the, to the right people and they receive the benefit of that of that funds. Mm. So that is specifically the reason for for that. Then the, the cost rega regarding um, that, because we know the, the charitable organizations is usually uh, donors and so forth. So the, the cost there of, there's certain requirements that we as auditors need to, need to fulfill. And based on the past few years, what happened in, in the auditing industry, um, it's, there's, there's quite, a, quite some new requirements that we need to meet and ensure that it, everything is sound and secure of this entity. And mm -hmm. something that, that people usually tend to forget is we not, we, we're not only looking at the figures in the financial statements. We look at your corporate governance. We look at your board of trust, directors and trustees. We look at where the money is spent, if it is for the objective of that company. So the auditing of the financial statement is not, here's your picture of the financial statement. This was, this was what happened in the past year, and there you go. But it's, it's much more than that, actually. So we need to say, uh, if we take one of the acts, is no claw. Um, so we need to say that, is there any non-compliance with laws and reg regulations? So what is the laws and regulations of the Welfare Act? And are you in line with that Welfare Act? If you're not in line, that's, that's a problem from our side, and we look into that as well. Okay, so that's one of the reasons, and the, we, we need to um, be on a standard of international levels. So uh, we, we don't some th thumb suck anything. We, there's there's a quite a few standards that we need to fulfill and ensure that it's based on the correct um, standard right. for international people, because most of the donors, of a lot of donors, come from uh, outside Namibia mm. and across the borders. So they need to ensure, or we need to ensure that we, it's on a standard that everybody understands and that is in line with the rest of the world in order to ensure that we eventually receive the funds. Right. So that's the, the reason for, for, for some of the costs. Right. Hannes, uh, just before yes. you proceed, just quickly, um, say for instance, I want to start up a welfare organization now. Yes. Uh, what are the requirements from your side in order for me to get that letter to take to the Ministry of um, Health? Of Health. Yeah. Um, the, the requirements, 
eventually is uh, as prescribed in the act so you need to ensure that you have an objective right. for that entity it needs to be you have to have your formal discussions that you have approached them and you're on in process with them okay. and then from there we will be able to uh, give Issue you the that letter, the, that letter. Right. yes if they are registered under a section 21 company um, in the welfare organization then they go through lawyers in order to register that if they go through a trust there's a bit of a different um, route in, in with that mm. so uh, the the companies need to be registered with a, a lawyer or attorney that usually does the registration for the 21 section 21 companies and then we will be able to assist with the um, audit function of that as well as the, for the trusts they need to be appoint they need to appoint us as auditors um, right. and come to us and say okay we have this organization we have are in the process but now we need a letter from your side and we then um, continue with that process right and then earlier you also mentioned that um, there are some legal requirements from your end that they need to meet in order for you to provide them with um, the correct um, auditing reports but that's not done to frame them right it's just done to assist them yes can you then further explain or elaborate more on that yes um, the what we do from our side is we look at the legal requirements that is in the act right um, and that is uh, that's not that's not for us to to frame frame them it's in order for them to to be assisted mm. in the way forward um, we as auditors I think past there was a, a, a gap perhaps between the function of the audit and what is actually required and right. I think our our we have to ensure that that company um, will be able to survive for the next five or ten years yeah. and it's a viable entity that is contributing to the society right. so that is basically the main objective of that um, the requirements that we need so uh, the the requirements we look specifically at the memorandum of incorporation that um, uh, is used to to register that company and then further on we look at the act so that is that is the legal requirements that we that we look at all right yes well, no do you still have anything to add on? Yes, there was a, a question regarding any alternatives. Now, there's not there's not an alternative for audited financial statements. Um, however, some of the donors require uh, 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 financial statements only for their project, or not financial statements, but uh, a kind of a um, they want to say that yeah, it's fine. This is this is in in line with what we have in mind, or so on. So mm. there's a few options regarding that um, in order to do some agreed upon procedures. That's uh, not. I know it's kind of technical terms, but um, something else to assist with them only for certain projects for that one company or for the one donor. So there is some alternatives rega regarding that, but unfortunately, for the order the financial statements for your welfare organisation, there is only you can only do the audit with one of the auditing firms. Right. Yes. Yeah. Anything? I th think th there was one <coughs> question that I remembered that was regarding a bank account. Um, why do they need a bank account in the entity's name? Mm -hmm. And as I said, is all of this, the auditor financial statements, your corporate governance, your registration, everything is directed to your corporate so social responsibility right. and ensuring that the funds is not used for or must use by the trustees or the directors of that company mm. so therefore the bank statement your financial statements your corporate governance is everything in order to prevent any fraud or misuse of funds and ensuring that's in, in the correct name and it goes to the correct people right. in the society within the borders of namibia sure Anes, thank you very much for that um, word of wisdom there um, covid 19 has really humbled us and brought us to a standstill but we want to know as welfare organizations how we can bounce back and, and, and bring ourselves to life again. And now I would love to engage with Susan Nell, who is a marketing expert and also a photographer. Susan, would you just run us through on how to come back into the industry, you know, after a, a setback caused by COVID-19? Thank you, Alphonse, for the opportunity. Um, also, thank you to Bank Vintuk um, and Lisa Foundation to just have us here discussing all of this. Mm. Um, I know from experience that this is, um, this is exactly what NGOs need um, to assist them right. um, to take it further. Um, I don't think it's news for any of us that NGOs are working really hard to actually solve problems mm. um, at basic level on the ground. Um, for us, that's, um, it's no news. For them, they are putting in a lot of effort in terms of volunteering their time, their efforts, um, their finances. Um, they need to find 
volunteers, they need to find f um, funds, all of this to make a greater social, um, sociable impact. And um, I think, unfortunately, due to the fact that time and money is limited, um, marketing gets shoved to the side. Exactly. Um, it's definitely not high on the priority list. And sadly, this creates kind of a cycle, a bad cycle for them. Um, with marketing, I also include communication, whether or not that is to the ministries, to the auditors, to your community that you're serving, to your potential donors. Um, this, is, this includes all of them. So this is the second thing. It makes it a lot difficult for them because they have to communicate to so many channels where they actually just want to do the thing that makes mm. the impact. So it's quite a challenge for them, and I do get that. Um, so one would ask, why then do marketing at all? Um, and the thing is, it's such a valuable tool to create awareness. Mm. Who you are, why are you doing what you're doing? What are you doing? Um, all of those answers the question and creates compassion and creates um, connection to a potential donor, to a potential volunteer, to, to anybody who can assist you, who wants to collaborate with you, even though they can't necessarily give you the funds, they want to collaborate right. you and help you in a different way. So that's, first of all, you need to build awareness through your marketing. Um, building that awareness will also start to create your own brand. Mm. A brand sometimes defines you by your logo and a smart, you know, smart sign, slogan. your slogan underneath, um, but a brand is so much more than that. Right. A brand needs to create trust. Mm. So by creating your awareness, by telling your stories, and specifically your success stories, you're not bragging about it, you're not putting a chip on your shoulder. You are just actually showing people that you know what you are doing, you are right. passionate about what you are doing, and you can trust me to give me the funds because I'm doing what I'm doing, and I'm doing that very well. Mm. Okay. Um, the second thing then, once you've established that trust, um, you can attract a lot more donors mm. um, because now you can you can stand in authority and you can present your case your, yourself your your impact that you're making and um, the only one thing there that I need to add is you have to remember that NGOs and um, let's say private sector speak two different languages as you would have heard now here as well <laughs> so you need to learn how to communicate on a donor level as well because you because you're an NGO, you are communicating to your community and you know exactly what to say and how to get to that need. That's right. But you do need your donor's assistance, whether or not it's time, whether or not it's money. You need them to understand what it's all about and what you are doing. So you need to start speaking their language as well. So you can't just go to anybody and do everything in front of them. You need to go ask, what is this company's um, social responsibility impact and, and benefits? Um, what do they do have as pillars um, that they, where would they give money to? So for instance, um, they would say, okay, this company has um, health and education as their main pillars. So now you know, okay, I'm in women empowerment, so I shouldn't even approach them. Mm -hmm. I could rather use my time more effectively and go to a place who actually um, wants to help with women empowerment. So just speak their language, go to them with, with, with knowledge also about them, not just with your own knowledge about what you are doing right. around here. So then you can att attract a lot more um, potential donors. Um, also, by creating awareness, you can attract a lot more volunteers. So people who want to help. Because um, now they are also passionate about what you are doing. They saw something on social media or what else type of marketing mix mm. you are using. Um, so now they can say, okay, listen, I want to help you too. Can I, I know a little bit about this. I know how to do auditing or I can, I can assist you with this um, because I also have a heart for that child that you are, that you are trying to help. Right. Okay, so it attracts them. Um, marketing then inspires the community by building that brand. Sure. It inspires people to... To, to stand up and if they, do, if they don't have the heart to do exactly that same thing, but maybe they've got a heart for something else. Um, and now it inspires them. If that person can do it, so can I. So let's right. make a greater impact. Okay, so you can inspire people. Um, and then, as I already actually said this, but you can build trust um, and relationship as you are going forward, even within who's your um, donors at that moment and create recurring donations, not only um, getting a once-off uh, sweetie. <laughs> so mm. There you go, you did well. Um, 
So I think the main thing is people think it's, it's, it's very simple and oh, I just need to post a few things on Facebook and or I just need to send them some pictures, but there need to be a plan behind it. There need to be a marketing strategy. Why right. are you doing these things? What is the message that you want to get out there? Um, and then, yes, then take it from there. Okay, there's a lot more into that, but um, yeah, that's basically the, the long and the short the of it. The basics, mm -hmm. perfect. Thank you very much for guiding us through what NGOs in Namibia needs to look at mm -hmm. in terms of marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I'd love to cross over to Panasha Daringo from Monjila Project Advisory. Please walk us through in terms of project management for NGOs in Namibia. Well, thank you very much for the, for the opportunity um, and for the platform from Capricorn and both Lithon Foundation. I think when we talk about projects, it normally sounds very complex, but we're all project managers in our own spheres, and right. we actually don't know it most of the time. So I'll give an analogy to try and explain the concept of project management and how it obviously trickles down to our normal sort of everyday mm. um, you know, organizational welfare. So if you decide you're gonna go to Swakopmund today, um, the decision to go to Swakopmund is, an, is what we call the, the initiation stage. In your thought process to go to Swakopmund, you think about, you know, what time do I want to leave? I want to leave on Sunday at 10 o'clock. I'm going to drive in my car. I'm going to drive with person X, Y, Z. We're going to drive through Karibib, and then we're going to go to Usakos. We're going to drive with this particular car. We'll have a spare tire in the mm. car. Um, I'm going to talk to my auntie at home. She's going to look after the house. And when I get to Swakopmund, I'll meet my grandmother there because she's, she's expecting us. So that whole planning phase, we do it every day. Um, we do it in everything that we do. When you're getting married, it's a project. When you're driving to Swakopmund, it's a project. And in project management, what we then try to do is to break down those processes across the different phase of a project. Mm. So we call the first phase the initiation phase. Then we go into what we call the planning phase. We go into a monitoring and evaluation and an execution phase. And then we close out the project. So in that trip to Swakopmund, that whole planning exercise is, is what takes the most amount of time. And in the concepts of project management, that's the most expansive phase of a particular project. Sure. And then after you've done all this planning, you then start driving. And when you're driving, you're constantly checking your speed. You're checking the time that you're driving. If you have a, you know, a tire puncture, you stop, you take out the spare tire, you put it in and you carry on driving, but you pick up the phone and you let the stakeholders know that guys, I'm running a little bit late. That's all project management, because what you're doing is you're integrating what we call the knowledge areas. So you're integrating scope management, which is where am I going to? I'm going right. to Swakopmund through Usakos. The minute I go to uh, Ochivarongo, it's no longer the same project. It's a different scope. Mm. So I'm deviating from my project, from my scope. If I'm running late, it affects my time. So I pick up the phone, I let my stakeholders know that guys, I'm running late, and this is all project management. It's right. all part of the monitoring and evaluation. If for whatever reason, um, you run out of money or you don't have enough money, it affects your cost, and that cost is all part of your project management. So if you take it in the, in the context of, a, of an organization, of a welfare organization, it's essentially the same principles. You, you, you run certain projects, so it, a donor gives you 100,000 to do a particular project, mm -hmm. and they expect you to manage all the aspects of a project. So from initiation stage all the way to planning, to execution, to monitoring and evaluation, all the way to close out. So in the context of a welfare organization, part of what we do in the form of a project management is develop what we call a project management plan. That really talks about how are you going to execute the project. And we've got what we call 10 knowledge areas. The first one talks about integration. How will you bring all these knowledge areas together? The second one talks about scope, the timeline of the project. So I've given you $100,000. In what period are you going to do this, this work? What are you gonna do in the first month, the second month, the third month? So that whole planning exercise is what we call the scope management, I mean the time management, where you really sit down and you say, this is what I'm gonna do from January to March, March to February, and you then tie that up with your, with your resources. And you say, for this particular period, these are the resources that I have at my disposal. Right. Person X is gonna help me with, with you know, doing X, Y, Z, and person Y is gonna help me with doing X, Y, Z. And you literally write it all down. 
because by writing it down, you have a planned approach to how you're actually going to execute that particular program. And then you go into the other components of a project, which is like risk. So you look at what can go wrong in my particular project. In the Swakobmund example, you could get a tire puncture. So you make sure you've got a spare tire. In your organization now, as you run your particular welfare organization, what could go wrong? Mm -hmm. I could run out of funding. My resources could could abandon me. How do I then manage and mitigate some of those risks? So when you develop that project management plan, you actually sit down and you say, what could go wrong as I execute this particular project? Right. Um, stakeholders, how do I deal with my stakeholders? Who are my stakeholders? You've got external stakeholders who are your donors, and then you've got stakeholders on the ground who are actually the people that are benefiting. So stakeholders, how do I engage with them? How do I communicate with them? Communication plan is a separate part. How frequent do you communicate with them? How do you report to them on what exactly you're doing? If we take the example of the, of the GDB, um, how do you actually roll out your programs? Do you give weekly updates to your stakeholders who are your donors? Or do you give them monthly reports? How do you manage the cost? That cost breakdown is, is once again a knowledge area. And that then feeds into your annual sort of reports, which then you know, ultimately become part of your closeout. So the minute you incorporate all this, you start showing a level of professionalism to the management of your welfare. Mm. And, and that's what we see is lacking in a lot of welfare organization, the ability to just sit down and say, I've got 10 projects that I'm doing. For each of the projects, I can't treat them as if it's one whole big pot. I need to treat each project as if it's a separate program, and each of those programs then has its own set of project management plans, right. and then I monitor and evaluate that based on what the project management plan says. So for a particular client or particular donor, you may only need to report once a month. For another one, you only need to report every six months. So you have to treat each of these projects as if they are completely separate, almost business units, because often the objectives, the scopes are all very different. And that then also finally then ties into what we call your goals and your scope, mm -hmm. which we, we call them SMART. So when you, when you put out your goals, they must be SMART goals. Right. SMART basically means it must be specific. What, what is this particular project supposed to do? It must be measurable. How do I measure the impact of this particular program? Mm. Is it that I go and I do surveys for the people that I'm actually sort of benefiting? Um, is it that I, I, you know, I do you know, reporting and, and mon constant monitoring and evaluation? The goals must be attainable. How, is what I'm trying to do realistically attainable? And the fourth one is it must be realistic. Can it really be done? Can I achieve this goal and this program that I'm trying to achieve? And then the last one is, is the T. It must be time bound. Y you can't have programs that are you know, perpetual. They must run from a certain date until a certain date. Right. And during that period, you must be able to evaluate them. Sure. Uh, Mr. Panasha, uh, we're talking about NGOs in Namibia. Yeah. Say, for instance, there's a meme in the village, you know, that knows nothing about project management. Does your office them assist them in running projects or manage their projects? So, so we run a, a, an, an NGO as well, um, which is called the PMI, which is a Project Management Institute. It's an international organization, but we've got a local chapter, a Namibian chapter. All right. And part of what PMI does is to support and assist with project management. So as a professional project management, you are required to, to, to earn what we call PDUs, professional development units. And you can do that by assisting certain, certain individuals. And, and we, we do assist in, in, in uh, project management. So, so the concepts are quite um, um, difficult face value, mm. but, the, but the implementation is actually quite easy and it sounds elaborate, but it's, but it's fairly simple. It's really sitting down and saying, okay, what are my 10 knowledge areas? What is my project? And how do I make sure that all these are being ticked off as I run through a particular project? Right, thank you very much. Uh, viewers, if you're just joining us for the first time, thank you for joining in. Um, if you have questions, please do drop them for us. We'll gladly attend to it after a while. But let's look at what we do in our community from Capricorn site.
this is uh, Capricorn's outreach to the community. They have donated a lot of, and, or invested a lot of money uh, in this project, and uh, the children are so happy. The kids were very, very pleased with uh, uh, the, what we have done here. Uh, really, the place has changed from something dull to something wonderful and colorful. It was such a great day to see the smiles on their little ones' beautiful faces, and I encourage each and every change maker to participate next time. Well, what an engagement from the audience and also from our panelists. This is very interesting. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for the questions that you have dropped there. Uh, I'll switch over to Ms. Sabina. You have mentioned or you talk more about wealth organizations. Our audience wants to know that um, what is the difference between a Section 21 and a wealth organization? Can you please take us through that quickly? Um. You know, when we look at the Section 21 company not for gain, they are registered under the Companies Act of 2004. Mm. And when you look at the Welfare Organization, it's the National Welfare Act um, of 1965. So there is two, it is two legal instruments that is involved here. So the difference is that um, a non-profit for a Section 21 company always have that element of a social welfare services ne, in its objectives. Um, and then when you look at the act, what the act uh, specifically identified, what is a welfare organization, then it is, like, it is similar with a Section 21 company. Ne. But the difference is coming in here is that the moment when a Section 21 company approach a donor to assist with a certain part of his um, organization program of project, ne? then that donor will ask them, are you registered as a welfare organization? Mm. Do you have um, a, a registration certificate? And then is where the, the, the applicant of the, the, the Section 21 group uh, uh, realize, but we, but we do not have it. Ne? So then they start asking, then they will come to us. Ne? So. When they come to us, ne, and even when you look at the, at the Income Value uh, Tax Act, ne, they also will define a charitable uh, 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 organization. And, and, and when people are receiving donations from, uh, from uh, abroad, then there is custom duties that you must pay and e income tax and so on. Mm. So Ministry of Finance will then ask them, are you registered with Ministry of Health and Social Service as a welfare organization? Because it is defined in their act. Ne? Now they sent now the, it's like what happened yesterday. They send the, the, the clients to our offices to, to, to register. Ne? Mm. Now the, the the, the, there is where the difference comes in because of what the donor is requesting. And as what he say that donors look at to your objectives and they look if you are registered under a certain legislation. Mm. So that is where we, 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 we bring the problem. So the Section 21 and the, the non-profit um, uh, organization, there is the objectives is similar. And even like the, rem the requirements, because they also need the memorandum of articles that is also uh, like a constitution in our a uh, case, ne? and they also need um, audited uh, reports and uh, um, f audited financial reports and so on. So there is not such a difference, but the difference came in the moment when the donor asked you, because they are uh, uh, well aware about this wealth organization. Even like um, most uh, of our wealth organizations registered, when they getting some food, from, for example, Woolworths. Ne? Woolworths will ask them, get for us a confirmation letter from Minister of Health and Social Services that you are compliant and that you are in line with your objectives. Right. So then we must write the letter. So most of them then realize welfare organizations you must register. And when you even look at the act, what the National Welfare Act said, is that when you start doing social welfare services with funds from the public, 
they, from the government, from a, a, a local authority, mm. then you must register it as a welfare organization. So that is where the, 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 the problem comes in. And I feel really pity for our uh, community members outside that doesn't know that what is a welfare organization, what is a Section 21 company, what is the benefit when I'm, I registered as a welfare organization, what is the benefit in, when I registered a Section 21 company. Because at the end of the day, uh, they will only be sent to the Ministry of Health and Social Services to register so that they can have that registration certificate mm. that, that give them that legal status to approach donors. And also, it, the donor will know that this organization is registered under a, 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 a legal uh, uh, instrument that will monitor ne, and that will make sure that this organization is accountable for what I will give right. to him or for this organization. Right. Thank you for that differentiation there. It's quite important that we know the difference between an no, NGO and a mm. work organization. But it's not that you're pushing the NGOs away. No, 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 never. When they approach our officers, uh, even like yesterday when I received the phone call from Switzerland, and this lady says, says um, the first um, uh, question that she asked me is that I, 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 I was referred by, by my lawyer that I should have a uh, welfare organization registration status. Uh, and her reason for that is to, to, to get tax exemption. Mm. So for me, it is a shock. Because when you start a welfare organization, it's because you realize there's a need. I want to help. Ne? Right. And it's what they say, emotions is also attached here. Because when we look at COVID-19, you can see how many of our people lost their jobs. Ne? Mm -hmm. They are really in a distress now. And now the person come and ask only to register for a tax exemption. What mm -hmm. does it tell me? Huh? Because our, our welfare organization is there to, to bring social welfare services, to bring relief, to improve and to help people out of that right. So I, 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 I talked to her, I th we, we, we spoke and I took her through the whole requirements and then she asked me, now, should I stop? I said, no. I will never say that you must stop. Mm -hmm. But when you are back in Namibia, so she will be back in May, come to my office and then we will have uh, um, a nice talk and I will help you and take you through the whole process. All right. Thank you for that. Um, over to you, Hannes. Um, a very interesting question. SGA, as an institution or financial auditing company. Do you guys also have social responsibilities that you render to the community? And if so, uh, how can they approach your organization and how can you assist them? And then also your fees are too high. Mm -hmm. you, the fees that you charge is normally for corporate companies, but I am a startup. How can you lower your rates to meet my needs? Okay, so <coughs> there's actually um, two pillars that we currently attend to. So we do our part in the community. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on that currently, uh, but there is a part where we go out to the community and assist um, with some places we have um, assisted with building some stuff at uh, one of the schools with Inventuk that is uh, disadvantaged. So mm. we, we tend to do that, our, our, our corporate so social responsibility as well. Um, and then regarding the fees, uh, I, I thought that question would come up some way. <laughs> um, and I would just like, uh, again, to, to come back from my, my first point is I really enjoy this discussion and it's very good because we as auditors get a lot of questions and a lot of these issues that we are currently um, discussing is something that we only pick up at the end of the first or the second year or the third year because people don't they, they, don't, they haven't applied, they haven't um, registered, and they don't have project management, they don't have any of the, the marketing, and then they come in the third year and say, okay, we have, we're, we're now three years behind, so can you please assist us? And now there's a lot of issues and stuff that's, that's um, there. Mm. So on that pillar, um, there is a certain cost for uh, any of this, and any of the other companies or, or audit firms will also charge you a cost. What we tend to do currently is, due to our social responsibility as well. Um, uh, my, myself, for instance, is involved with uh, quite a lot of the, the non-profit organizations and welfare organizations, and we tend to ensure that we keep your cost as low as possible in order, and we part of our fee that we, um, that we disregard for, for each year is part of our social responsibility mm -hmm. in order to ensure that, that that welfare organization will be our client for the next year, and is still contributing uh, to to the society within the next few years. All right. 
Thank you very much, Hannes. Uh, Suzanne, a very good one for you. Um, do you think we should stick to the old way of doing marketing or do we need to divert and, and do the new normal? <laughs> Um, I think uh, I think uh, the new normal came for marketing even before COVID. COVID just enhanced it a little mm. bit um, to use online, to use social media, to yeah, to um, to make use of all the new tools that's now available online um, to assist, to be able to tell your story properly, um, to connect with potential donors. So so yes, I would say. Um, Social media is, is, is kind of the obvious one to choose for, for an NGO because many of the times you could get away fairly free. Um, but that's just part of a marketing mix, remember. That shouldn't be the only thing that you do. So you mm. will need to have a strategy. And even you should even uh, need to have a um, social media marketing strategy. Uh, why and what and how are you telling your story? How are you connecting? Um, is somebody commenting on your, on your content? Um, and, and how are you responding to their comments on your content, et cetera, et cetera. So, but there are plenty of tools out there to, to make use of, um, as I say, which is fairly free um, that you can start off with. Um, Facebook, for instance, you could, instead of having your own website, which you need to pay for, you could just start by, by having a Facebook page um, and posting your stories there. So that once somebody asks you, listen, is there some place I could go have a look at what you're doing? You can refer them to that. Um, and that's almost like having a basic website without actually um, having, having, to the, for it. having to pay for it. Right. So there's options. And then from your end, do you perhaps provide trainings in terms of marketing or photography? Um, and if so, where can they find you? Well, they can find me. We, we can drop the link <laughs> <laughs> um, at the bottom. Um, but they can find me personally or contact me via my website, which is susanelphotography.com. Um, but um, I know that Lithon Foundation also provided some of these trainings from time to time, and I also volunteered to assist Lithon with that um, mm. in the future. So by all means, I'm sure that's gonna gonna come um, away very shortly as well. So yeah, they should be. But in the meantime, they're welcome to contact me directly. All right, thank you very much. Kay. And then Mr. Panasha from Monjila uh, Project Advisory site. Um, the audience wants to know, do you perhaps give training on project management and how long does it take? Because it looks quite informative and educational as well. Yeah, so, so thank you for the question. So, so we do give training. Um, currently we're doing quite a lot of training for a lot of government entities um, on project management, um, on how to sort of roll out uh, projects. Through the, the PMI chapter, we also do quite a lot of uh, training. Uh, it's, it sounds difficult, but, it, but it's really not difficult. Uh, a, a lot of it has to do with that, that planning phase. And, and I mean, you know, for, 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 for entities, that's, that's really what you want to try and work on because that helps with your, with, your, with your funding. When you do apply for funding, if you've got a well thought out plan, you know, it shows the, the donors and investors that this guy really knows what he's going to do with the funds. He's, he's thought it all through. And then when you start rolling out, you're just constantly referring to what you've, what you've initially sort of uh, planned on paper. Right. But, but we do give training. Right. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, because of time, there's two more from Ms. Sabina. Um, and it goes as like, for instance, why does it take so long in Namibia, you know, to get uh, NGO registered? And you also spoke about the bill, the mm. new bill that has mm. to be implemented. Can you briefly talk about that? Mm. Um, as what they say previously is that um, we really want to uh, make the to fasten the process ne, um, to help uh, the welfare organizations to be registered. Um, the, the only thing is now that um, this function is decentralized mm. to the regions. So yeah. it means now that um, this information is then accessible and it's affordable. Is there not any more necessary for someone from the north to come to Venduk to come and see Ms. Jacobs? Mm. Because it involves you now transport costs as well as that your accommodation and f meals and all those things and so on. So uh, that's why that is decentralized. So it is now close to the people. And it uh, depends now on the number of the meetings. When you look as what I say, the old act um, require quarterly meetings. Mm. So there is where 
um, sometimes in quarterly meetings for the regional welfare committee and only two, six months, uh, two, two times in the year, twice in the year right. for the board. Ne? And there is where the delay is coming in. Ne? But um, when the regional welfare committees, they have uh, 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 applications that is ready for discussion, then the act make provision that we can ask for a special uh, meeting, a special board meeting where we can discuss and give them things through and so on. Mm. So that is actually what happened in March when the board said we discussed there was from the applications that was um, was referred back with recommendations, but we make provision for a special meeting and not to delay the process and so on. So this is one of the issues that we really look into it, how we can speed up the process and not do it. People must delay uh, uh, and wait so long for their registration certificate. Right. And the other thing is sometimes why it takes so long is that it is, uh, uh, you will sit and discuss the, 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 the constitution because the constitution is the one that they really have challenges with mm. to develop one. So they will go back, uh, so they will send back and come back and so on until it, it is really uh, in line with what they want to do and, it's, and it is related to their names and so on. Right. So I think that when we give a proper consultation on the constitution, then it, then it will not delay so much. But it also depends uh, from the applicant. After you discuss the whole requirements, some of them never came back. Ne? Some of them realized, no, I don't think that it is really what I want to do. Mm. Is there a template that they can maybe There access? is on our ministry website. Uh, I think it's in 2019, I already posted um, the application, the, 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 the guideline for the constitution, as well as a guideline on why you must register. Wonderful. Well, yeah. Thank you very ministry much. Website. Yeah. Thank you very much. Quite a very engaging topic. And I believe we, we can actually do more. We can talk more about this. But mm. because of time, uh, allow me to just revisit um, what we've been doing in the community. So let's just have another insert before we continue. And I live in Havana, Zambia Street, in Moses Garwemp. Before we are getting these tanks, we were just fetching water in the tapes. And the problem, the tapes were a bit far. Uh, sometimes the tapes, you are fetching water today, and maybe tomorrow the tapes are closed. Before the tank, we were just uh, depend on those tapes. We were just having this one somewhere here and the other one there, the other one is very far there. There were only three. So people, they were suffered a lot because you have to walk a distance, more than 400, 400 meters, 500 meters. So some of them, they are carrying on their shoulders, heads, they use those trolleys. So they make plan for them to be easier for them to fetch water. Bank Vintuk uh, partnered with the Mayoral Relief Fund, part of City of Vinduk, to basically drive access of water in rural communities. As a connector of positive change, we believe that it's critical for us to also take care of our community in which we are operating in. And with the COVID pandemic, we thought it's really necessary to bring access of water to the communities as closely as possible where they are living. The illness that I've been had here, it's just all about hepatitis, which was people talking about. And I even see by myself people suffer for this disease. This thing, it's making it the life easier for the community. Even like people having their own salon, for you to have a salon or to have a barber shop, you need electricity and you need water. I just want to say oh, thanks to have this tank. Now when we are fetching the water, now these tanks, they are near. That's why we are using these tanks now.
Welcome back to our discussion on positive change. I'd love to introduce to you, as we close off today, the founder or the founding member of Lithon Foundation, Mr. Adrian Hlobrer. Over to you, Mr. Hlobrer. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Alphonse. Uh, George Bennett Shaw said there's two most important days in your life is the day you were born and then the day you discover why you were born. So as you can see, obviously I was born 52 years back, but at the age of 34, uh, I discovered my purpose in life. And that's through the story of Nehemiah and the Bible where I saw a man that saw his fellow Jews that were in trouble and despair, and he acted. Uh, he decided to go to the king, went back to Jerusalem, and he started to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and basically it made a huge impact on the lives of people and also on history. And that in inspired me then with my wife to start Lethon as a company that we believe through our skills as engineers we can make a physical impact, but we also want to make a social impact. So from early on we were always involved in social impact projects. So we were helping other organizations and then in 2014 we decided to formalize our social impact uh, side of the business and we established Lethon Foundation. And the focus of Lethon Foundation are four areas. The first is to assist what I would like to call social impact organizations. That includes NGOs, welfare organizations, the whole range of organizations that wants to make social impact. The second thing is also to network with business people to see whether we can get the business people to mobilize funds and resources to assist social impact organizations to do the work that needs to be done on the ground. The third focus area is also then to do mentorship. So we do a lot of mentorship with young people and prepare them for life, also to become good citizens and to start businesses and to make an impact through the businesses and the persons that they want to be. And obviously the fourth one is obviously to raise capital and money through our own business, but also with other businesses. And we've got 100% flow through. So if somebody gives money to Lethon Foundation, we will take that money and we will apply it 100% to the source. We cover the overheads on the foundation cost. Now to continue where Johan Swanepoel started this morning about collaboration and how we can work together, I want to share my story with you. So allow me a few seconds to just to share what happened with me in my life. I've been struggling with my health uh, since school. I had a colon disease that eventually at the age of 30 turned into a liver disease. And at the age of uh, 34, uh, 34, 30, um, my liver disease started to, to appear. I went through life in that way. And in 2014, uh, they told me, the doctors told me, I've got early, early signs of a cancer in my colon. So I went into for an operation, they had to remove my colon. After that, my liver got worse, and in 2015, I was put on a liver transplant program. That lasted for a year and a half, and by the end of 2016, I almost died. Uh, my liver got so worse that I actually lost my consciousness. Uh, I was flown out of Windhoek to Joburg uh, on an emergency flight. When I arrived in Joburg, the doctors told me, listen, uh, he's knocking on the door, probably not make it. And then a few miracles happened. Um, I recovered. Uh, they put me back on the program a bit later. And on the 1st of <coughs> February, when they put me back on the program, a young man, Bryn McGree, passed away. And he decided to donate his, uh, uh, his, his organs uh, before he passed away. And then on the 3rd of February, I was reborn. So I got a new liver. And my body that was physically not healthy, I was sick, you know, immediately recovered. And it, and it gave a new life to me. And I want to use this story to illustrate the power of collaboration. Because my, my, my youngest daughter told me this biology lesson. A liver, <coughs> a liver is not uh, one cell. A liver is cells that come together in tissue. The tissue then forms a liver. And once that liver is then transplanted into your sick body, healing comes and then a, 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 a rehabilitation of your body starts to happen. And that's almost what we need to do. We as people should be like the cells that come together in our organizations, welfare organizations, businesses, churches, government. We then all come together in our different tissues, organizations, and we become the new liver that the world needs. And only through collaboration and working together as like-minded people, we can make a real impact. Uh, one company, one person, you are limited with the impact you can make. 
But if we can come together and we can combine our sources, our resources, our skills, we can really impact Namibia. We all know the, the challenges we face. We see it all around us. We follow it on Facebook. Uh, we see the needs out there. We've got a lot of amazing organizations busy at the moment doing amazing work, but they are limited. They need funding, they need skills, they need accountants, they need project management, and that's where Leithon also comes, comes in to provide that offering to organizations together with Capricorn Group as we've partnered today to show that there's companies out there, there's organizations that care about social impact. And this is also the purpose of this whole session we had today, is to invite you to come and contact us, talk to us, talk to Capricorn, talk to Leithon, come to us and we will assist you as best as we can, whether it's with skills, whether it's with funding, we, we don't know, we, we can identify that and to do that. And by coming together, that is when we can go out there and make that impact in people's life. So thank you for coming, especially for the panel. I would like to thank you, uh, Pan Panashi, for all your excellent work that you are doing and also offering to, to assist uh, with Sabina since we've met the first time, uh, what a journey we've been on uh, as you assisted us also with the footsteps that we had to take. And now we are also in the position to assist the ministry to help you build a database and to empower organizations out there. Uh, Alphonse for doing such an excellent job as uh, MC today. Hannes, thank you for being the accountant that I know you are. And thank you also for offering to assist welfare organizations that they can come to you for advice and services. Uh, and, that, and Susan, thank you for also sharing the marketing. So as you can see, through collaboration, working together, we can really make a difference out there. Thank you very much, and we trust to hear from you soon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Adrian. What a heart-touching story over there. And it's true, it's only through collaboration that we can bring a positive change in our country. Um, maybe final remarks before we close off. Um, let me give each of you maybe five seconds, starting from Panasha. Yeah, once again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, like I said, we, we are available to assist. I think we had a chat just now with Ms. Sabrina that as a, as a project management organization, at least the chapter, we, we, we would like to, to work closely with, uh, with the ministry mm -hmm. and to support uh, the foundations wherever we can. All right, so contact number maybe? Um, I, think, I think we can be contacted through the Lethon Foundation, Foundation. because we, we've gotten a, a partnership with them. So. Thank you very much. Ms. Sabina, final yeah. remarks? Yeah, first of all, I really want to thank Lithon Foundation in collaboration with Capricorn Foundation um, that is um, linked with Bank Wind. Mm. You know, of when I'm sitting here and I listen to the panelists, now it, I really feel so relieved that I know that our welfare organizations, they really struggle a lot. And they have really challenges in, in to bring their welfare organization uh, in another stage, because we always say let the welfare organizations move to like a business type, né? because it's like you are backing, backing, backing. Mm -hmm. But if you have this marketing strategy, if you have to know how, to, know how to, to, to plan your projects and so on, then it will bring you in a better position and so that you can get a donor that will have trust in you and that right. can see, but this is a very good organization. I, and I really want to thank the panelists for this uh, eye opening mm -hmm. for me and now I can uh, assist assist our uh, applicants far better than what I did. Because for me, I feel that uh, welfare organizations are moving in a new season, and I'm glad to be part of that season, because it's a, season, it's a new season with new trends of development and, and initiatives and changes sure. in, the, in the welfare organization world that we are experiencing. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Anas, final remarks? <laughs> Yes, I think this is really a wonderful opportunity and I would really like to invite all the non-profit organizations and welfare organizations to really contact Lethon and any other person on this panel that you need assistance with. Um, we see it in, in the nature of the business that there is really a large scope for people to develop skills and ensure that the, the requirements are met that is set out by the Act and so forth. And uh, when I listen to the panelists, I, I'm, I'm really relieved and, and I feel there's, there's, there's something breathing here that's going to be a, a big impact on, on, right. on Namibia and the social responsibility um, that each company has within Namibia. And uh, with this panelist and the information that's shared here today, I really would like to encourage you to use this information uh, in the furtherance of your business and your, your, your objectives of your welfare organization or non-profit organization. 
Right. Suzanne? Okay, um, Alphonse, thank you again um, to Lithon and Capricorn as well, um, just for the platform. I have one simple remark, um, and that is that the world needs inspiration to create positive change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So please tell your stories of what you are doing out there right. um, so that they can also be inspired to do either the same or something in line with that and make, a, make an impact. Right. Well, the world needs a new lever and that can only come through collaboration. Thank you for tuning in. From our side, the Capricorn uh, Foundation and the Bank Winduk with the Lithon Foundation, we'd really love to thank you for taking out your time and just tuning in, for using your data to share and to stream, and for all the questions that came in. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yes, if you need any questions, our contacts are on the websites. Please do visit us and give us a, a ring and let's talk. Let's help you through. Don't operate in isolation. We are here to work together and to bring a positive, positive change and make a significant impact in our communities. Thank you very much. On behalf of these children who can't, who don't have the proper vocabulary here to say today, on behalf of them, I would like to thank you and I would like to thank the group for this difference. It's an orphanage of children and they've never had running water or toilets and limited infrastructure. So we decided to invest 300,000 Namibian dollars into this project.